Guitar tabs are the easiest, fastest, and certainly most popular way to learn riffs, songs, and solos. But there's a big problem with guitar tabs, and I'll tell you what it is in this video. People think that the tab is going to show them how to play a song. So they memorize the notes, they practice, but it still doesn't sound great. There's still something wrong. So they practice more and they do get a little better, but they're still not really hitting the mark. Over time, this is discouraging and people end up concluding things like, well, I'm just not that good. I'm not talented enough. Maybe they let it go or maybe they stick with it and they dabble on the guitar for years, but still never get where they want to be. I'm going to show you what the problem is and how to fix it. Guitar is a very visual instrument and we are primarily visually oriented creatures. So when we watch someone play guitar, what do we see? Well, they're moving their fingers on the fretboard and where their fingers go, that corresponds to the pitches of the notes that we hear. So it looks like it's all about the fretboard. And then we have guitar tabs giving us information about the fretboard and only about the fretboard. So that further reinforces our bias and convinces us that guitar playing is all about the fretboard. And that is the crux of the problem. Let's step back a moment away from the guitar and just consider in general terms, what is music and what are musicians doing? Fundamentally, musicians are arranging sounds in time. So we have a sound component and we have a time component. And it is the interplay of these two things that creates music. So the sound component relates to the notes and the pitches. That's all about the fretboard. But what about the time component? If you're playing a riff and you put your finger on the wrong fret and you played a wrong note, you'd probably notice and, and you'd stop and you'd say, oh, that wasn't right. You'd do it again until you got it right. But it's just as wrong to play the right note at the wrong time as it is to play the wrong note. So you can get every note right. You can play all the right notes, but if you don't play them at the right time, it's always going to suck. But here we all are putting the lion's share of our focus on the fretboard, ignoring time, basically guessing at time, letting time just kind of be whatever we think it might be or try to get close to it. Very fuzzy, very imprecise, and we think that's good enough. But the truth is, it's not good enough. In fact, it is the inability to precisely control time that is actually causing the vast majority of players to not progress on the instrument and to not sound good. That's the problem. So the real problem with Guitar Tab is that it just gives us partial information. And that by itself wouldn't be a terrible thing, except most people are unaware that it's partial information. They don't know the importance of what's missing or even what's missing. That doesn't mean that tabs are bad or that I'm saying you shouldn't go use tabs to learn whatever you want to learn. But I'm saying that it's limited and it's only what I call stage one learning. So in other words, the first step to learn something is you got to learn the notes, you where your fingers go on the neck or, or the chords or whatever it is. You've got to learn that piece and that comes first. Because obviously, you have to first learn where your fingers are going and be able to get them to do what you want them to do on command before you worry about doing them at the right time, okay? You can't get them at the right time unless you can get them. But after that, we enter stage two. And this is the problem is that most people don't know that there's a stage two. They don't know what to do to get better. So they never enter stage two, nobody told them. But stage two is where after you've got the notes, now we need to get a feel for exactly how every note relates to a master clock. Developing a good sense of time is actually very difficult for a couple of reasons. First of all, it's not concrete. Like the fretboard is something you can see. So it's very specific. It's very easy to understand that, you know, you put your finger here, you put your finger there. Time is abstract. You, you can't see it. You only feel it. So, so it's much harder to grasp, first of all. 
And second, it's hard to develop a sense of time because it's hard to self-correct. You know, the, the process when you play a wrong note is that you notice you made a mistake and then you do it again to get it right. Well, it's difficult to self-correct when it comes to time because if you have a bad sense of timing, you don't know that your timing is off. So you don't know how to self-correct. Nevertheless, it is possible and I will give you the answer here and show you a process by which you can develop a better sense of time and improve your musicianship and make everything you play sound great. Now a minute ago I mentioned this idea of a master clock. In music, the master clock is what we call the pulse, or it's also called the beat or the count. In a recording situation, we call it the click. It all means the same thing. It's the master clock. And every note you play relates to this master clock. It doesn't matter whether it's a rhythm part or a lead part, a melody, a, a solo, doesn't matter. Every note relates in some way to this master clock, both the start time of the note and the stop time of the note. They're either on the pulse points or they're in between the pulse points. And if they're in between, they're on a specific subdivision of that pulse. So right there, you can see that to have good timing, you need to have good awareness and a good feel for the flow, the even flow of this underlying pulse as you play. Now one of the things we can do to learn more about timing is we can study and learn about rhythm notation. Rhythm notation teaches us which notes are on the pulse points and which notes are in between and all about the subdivisions and all of that. And it's not terribly difficult to learn that stuff. The value of that really just comes down to being able to intellectually grasp it better so that it's not so abstract. So it, it makes it a little bit more concrete. But don't for a second think that just because you understand rhythm notation and you understand you know, where the count should be, that means you have good timing because it doesn't. There is a world of difference between thinking something and doing it. Just because you have the idea in your head or you can count in your head doesn't mean that you actually have good timing. Rhythm is kinesthetic. It's in the body and it's something that you feel. So if you understand rhythm notation, that's a great first step. And that's actually a process I would recommend for someone that, that wants to develop their timing is first step, yes, learn about rhythm notation, learn what it's supposed to, to be, but understand that that's not enough. We have to take it from the head down into the body. The majority of people just don't really have a great sense of timing and flow of pulse where they can feel it and it goes on autopilot, goes automatic as they're playing. This is something that has to be developed over time. Now there are a few people that are particularly good at it and gifted at it. And those people, maybe they never learned rhythm notation. They just played a lot and they listened to music and they just kind of got it. Well, that's probably like 1% that can do that. There's actually a word for the ability to feel pulse in your body and move your body with that pulse. It's called dance. And you know, some people are better dancers than others, but it's very much the similar kind of thing going on here, being able to feel pulse in your body and express pulse as you're playing an instrument, it's very related to dance. It's basically the same thing. It's kind of a, a very specific kind of dance that we're doing here as we play the instrument. In any case, by all means, you know, learn rhythm notation. It's definitely going to help. It's going to make it be less abstract and, and more real to you, more understandable and therefore more relatable, more specific. Great. But then the real task is moving it from your head into your body. And how do we do that? Well, it really just boils down to keeping even time, expressing even time. The easiest way to do that is tap your foot. You know, so you should tap your foot with everything you, that you're practicing, every song you learn. If you can't tap your foot as you play a song, then I guarantee your timing sucks. Now, I do want to say something about this foot tapping business. It doesn't have to be your foot necessarily. I mean, it's just that it's convenient to tap your foot because when you're playing the guitar, your feet aren't doing anything. So you could tap your feet and you could, it doesn't matter whether it's your toe or your heel or both foot or, you know, either one or maybe you just sway your head. But the advantage of tapping your foot is that it is a very specific mark in time. 
In other words, as you tap, you'll hear that tap. I mean, provided you're not on carpet or a rug, which I'd say, you know, don't do it on that. Do it on a hard surface. If you do it on a hard surface, then you're going to hear that very specific point in time. And the more specific that point is, the more specific your groove and your pulse is. So that's what we really want. Another thing that's really going to help your timing and your groove and your sense of flow and momentum and pulse is going through some kind of an organized method that starts with relatively simple rhythms and then gradually builds to more complex rhythms and, and offbeat patterns. It's easy to keep pulse when you play a rhythm that is closely integrated with it. In other words, something that's uh, virtually in unison with the pulse would be the easiest. And, you know, your hands move and your foot, your, which is your pulse is, is tapping at the same time, and it's easy to, to line those things up and kind of make them one thing, even though you're moving different parts of your body. It takes, you know, some limb independence to kind of get that thing together, but, you know, that's what we need. So it's easy to do it at the beginning when you've got simple rhythms, and then that will carry us through, that momentum will carry us through as we gradually build to more and more complex rhythms. On the other hand, if you just jump in and try to play uh, complex offbeat rhythms, your pulse is going to be a little bit messed up, but you're, again, you're not going to know it because you don't have a sense to compare it against. You don't know what really even flow is. And so, you know, you can't really get there by just doing the hard one over and over and over. You need to start simple, get your momentum there where you can create a natural flow and then gradually increase. Now, my core methods will accomplish this for you, or you can find some other materials, but find some kind of materials with gradually increasing rhythms and work on keeping your flow throughout. And I want to say something about listening as you play, because ultimately, that's the mechanism of self-correction. It's when you hear that something's not right, then you want to fix it and, and make it right. Generally, our attention can't be on groove fully because we're busy playing, you know, and to the point that you're focused on the fretboard, you're thinking about where your hands are going or wondering if you're going to get that next chord or, or whatever you're doing, to the extent you're doing that, you're not listening. Attention is only, you know, so much and you can really only put it primarily on one thing at a time. So this whole rhythmic aspect of playing is something that we need to drive into the body and make it, make it automatic so that we can feel it and we don't really have to think about it. But sometimes as you're playing, it's really good to withdraw your attention from the fretboard and really listen fully to what you're playing and, and feel how does that really sit in the groove? How is my instrument playing and meshing with the drums, for example? Well, you only know that if you're really listening carefully to the drums, and you can't do that until the fretboard part can go on autopilot. So that means playing enough that you don't really have to concentrate so much on what your hands are doing. They'll kind of do it automatically. That's kind of a prerequisite for developing really good groove. So don't think for a moment that just because, you know, your hands are moving on the fretboard that you've got, you've got it nailed and, and it's done and, you know, you're, you're a great player. You know, that's a starting point. And then you can move into this stage two where you can really make your, your grooves good and then everything will be working. I guarantee that if you do that and you really master the timing aspect of music, it will improve the quality of your playing by leaps and bounds. You're going to sound a whole lot better than you ever thought you could. So thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe, click the notification bell, and if you want even more help, join me on Patreon. Plenty of material there, plenty of good coaching going on, you know, to get right to the core of what the issue is and how to overcome it. Take it easy. Good luck with your playing, and I'll see you next time.